All right, guys, I'm going to get started here. Um, basically, what I wanted to do with this webinar, with this presentation, is to go through the anatomy of a website sale A to Z. Now, I'm not going over how to fill out forms because we've got videos on that. You guys should go in the portal and watch them if you haven't watched them already. And I'm not going to go over, you know, kind of like the minutia of the presentation materials because we have videos that teach you how to sell sites. What I'm going over here are some tips and pointers that are important to the sale of sites, some of the crucial steps and stages. I will be covering one type of sales methodology, the AIDA system a little bit, just because it gives us a logical framework to even have this discussion within. Now, without further ado, anatomy of a website sale. Let's start. Okay, so I go over here. Okay, so these are the, kind of the, the core areas I'm gonna be covering. Initial contact, lead setting. Um, some some tips and pointers on that. I'm going to be going over the demonstration itself. I'm not going to cover how to conduct a demo, but I'm going to cover some of the core areas within a demonstration that are really important for you to understand, maybe give you a little bit better understanding of how those core areas affect everything. Uh, we're going to talk about doing a needs analysis and some note taking. Now, how to do your needs analysis, in other words, how to do page counts and stuff like that. I've done videos on that. We've done stuff on that really exhaustively. It's in the portal back there. Again, you know, you should get in there, take a look at that stuff if you haven't already. Proposal generation. I'm not going to cover how to generate a proposal, but I'm going to go over some of the key points within that. Um, some areas that everybody can do a better job on at any given time. And finally, closure and intake. So we're going to be walking through these various steps and stages and just basically doing an outline of, you know, what matters, what doesn't, and I'll show you. Okay, so first step, first area that I think a lot of people could do better at, and I've witnessed it a lot, I've trained on it a lot, I've gone through this for years and years and years, and that is telemarketing, right? People getting on the phone. Whether your lead comes, whether you buy a lead, whether you find a lead, whether a lead is handed to you, whether someone walks up to your front door of your, your business and pounds the door down, you know, you're going, to, you're going to have to at some point set that lead, right? You have to set the lead. And in that process, generally speaking, you're on the phone, you're talking to this person and they're remote to you. Now, there are situations obviously where you're, you're talking in person to somebody, like if you're doing trade shows or home shows and a lot of you make a lot of sales that way. So I'm not going to in any way, you know, dispute that. But when it comes to phone sales traits, a lot of people don't really ever think through it. They don't, they don't go through it and say, what are the important traits? So I'm gonna go over what they are right here. First of all, being clear, well-spoken and communicative, being able to clearly get a message across. A lot of people fail in this area because they look at, they look at the lead as if it's something synthetic and it's really not synthetic. And that's why point two is creative and improvisational, but you can't be creative or improvisational if you're not first understood, right? If you're not understood by somebody, somebody doesn't, you know, grasp what you're talking about because you start off in a strange way or you haven't really thought out what you're going to say, then, you know, you're not going to really do anything positive there. And of course, being creative, and I know creative is spelled wrong, um, being creative and improvisational is really about, you know, I, when I look at how people are making calls, right? A lot of people will start up, they'll, they'll sit there, they'll have like either something typed up on their screen, a spiral bound notebook with some written down notes or whatever. And they'll start up the call, you know, hello, my name is blank. I'm from blank. I want to talk to you about blank. No, I think that's a completely wrong way to start if you're trying to do lead setting, right? You have to call up. If you're going to call up a business, you've got a lead sitting there. You call up and you say, Hey, you know, say that it's Acme Gutters Incorporated, right? They sell gutters to houses, to homeowners. You're going to call up and say, hey, you know, I noticed something. I was looking for gutters that, for my house and I, I just stumbled upon your site and I see you guys have some real problems. Can I talk to somebody there who's in charge of that? Because I happen, you know, I'm, yeah, I need gutters for my house. You, you open up and I'm not telling you to like, you know, outright lie, right? But open with something improvisational that gives you a reason other than being a telemarketer to call this business. Because, you know, everybody, we're all used to it, right? How many people here on this webinar, if I called you up, if somebody rings your phone right now and that person starts with, hi, my name is blank and I'm from blank and I want to sell you blank. 
how many of you are going to listen? You're not. You're going to immediately shut down. You're going to completely stonewall, wall up, lock down, hang up the phone probably, curse the phone after you hang it up and forget about it a second later and never give it another thought as long as you live. That's what's going to happen. But if that same person called up and said, hey, you know, I noticed you have a web development company and there's something I got to really talk to you about because I saw it and it just clicked in my head and I wanted to talk to somebody at your company. You could be completely improvisational. You could be completely, you could be crazy even, right? But you're going to listen because that person is talking to you as a person, not like a robot spitting something out of a, you know, an autoprompter or something from Star Trek. That's what, that's a very important point in the getting people to, to listen to you, that process. And then, of course, being insightful, well-versed. What do I mean by insightful and well-versed? Well, if you're calling up a business and you know that it's a pizza shop, then have some common sense about that business. Know what that business is doing. Know how that business operates, right? You don't call a pizza shop and say, hey, I know you sell pizzas via email. No, they don't do that, right? You have to basically be generally aware of how the business operates. Now, I know that we're not all experts in every single business out there, but I mean, there's three basic types of business, right? B2C, B2B, B2G. Business to business, business to customer, business to government. And then, of course, we've got the multiple types of retail. You have online businesses that sell via the internet. And they ship stuff through the mail. You have businesses that deliver their content or service via, the, via remote you know, means like we do. Then you have businesses that require the customer to come into the business and physically do whatever. You could say that you have a fourth type of business, type of business where they leave their location of business and go out to customers' homes and conduct business there. But really, that's kind of, they're in the same ball game anyways when it comes to marketing as a business that has to get a customer to show up because they're, they're having a, a, what we would call a kinetic relationship with the customer, right? They're actually interacting in meet space with that customer where they're bouncing into them and they're talking to them, right, in person. Be well-versed in this stuff. Understand the type of business you're talking to. It's not about doing a huge amount of research or anything. It's about knowing it off the top of your head what kind of business you're talking to so that when you're speaking to them, and you're having conversations with this person or this business owner, whoever they are, you know, you're, you're having meaningful conversation. That's really it. Fun, funny, and humorous, right? When it comes to how a phone game, you have to, be, you have, to have fun with it, Right. I, years and years ago, it was one of my first jobs and I had to set leads on the phone, right? And I sucked at it. I was terrible. I'll tell you guys, it really was bad. I couldn't set a single lead. I was just bombing at this, terribly bombing. Then I realized, I said, look, I'm just going to have fun with this. And once you had, once I had fun with it and I stopped taking it so serious and I would just joke with people, get them to laugh, et cetera, it opened the door for them to listen to me so that I could get their attention and then I could actually set leads, before, I was trying to be all serious with people. If you're really serious, sometimes you have to be serious because you can't, you can't uh, not be a professional, right? But you have to mix that up. You have to be able to be professional at the same time be fun and funny. You know, if you go to either extreme, you're going to bomb, right? If you're just, you know, Frank Grimes from the Simpsons episode, you remember him? He was like this guy that was 100% serious his whole life. And, you know, he just hated Homer because... Homer was this goofball who kept ma- who was making it in life and he was failing despite all his efforts. You can, you can push so hard in that direction that you're, you know, you're like a robot. People don't want that. You also can be so ridiculous that people don't take you seriously. So it's a balancing act. A lot of this is just common sense. Now you'll notice, I'm not going to go over scripts with you guys. I'm not going to cover you know, all the different multitudes of ways that you can structure a script. I don't personally like scripts. I don't believe in scripts so much, okay? I know that we have scripts we give you guys, and that's to help you out. And that's something that, and it's important that you have them. But I'm not a big believer in them because I never use them. When I did use them, I failed. When I got away from scripts and I just had like some bullet points in front of me or a general sort of philosophy of how exactly I was going to sell, then I became successful because I learned that really there isn't, there are no rules, right, to this. This isn't something that's done in a robotic manner. Anyhow, moving on from the phone game, I want to introduce you guys to this. Now, this is a system. You probably heard about this system before. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, it was the scene Alec Baldwin went over. He went over AIDA and he made a big, you know, mockery of a sales force there doing, using this. But AIDA is a legitimate type of system. It's actually used and it's been used in real estate sales and in other forms of sales. And I think it's a very logical framework for us to use to have a discussion about the components of a sales process 
with regards to our industry, right? And it stands for attention, interest, decision, and action. And I put some arrows here, you know, just to, to explain or shed a little light upon how these apply to our industry, right? Getting someone's attention. First, you have to get someone's attention in order for, to get them to be able to listen to your pitch, right? Once you have their attention, you have to get their interest so that they bother to comprehend or mentally process what you're saying. They don't look at you as like you're just babbling at them. Then you have to get them to make a decision. Are they going to listen to you more? Are they going to uh, invest something in this relationship with you? And I know that sounds deep, but it's not deep. It basically just means, are they going to set an appointment with you? Are they going to, you know, stand there and hear you out? <clears throat> And you have action at the end, right? Which is they've set this appointment. Are they going to show up to the appointment? A lot of times people will be good at setting appointments. They'll have like a cancellation rate of 90%. You want people to, to make time and show up. You have to cinch the deal at the end, right? You have to button it up, we used to say. And I'm going to go through this and I'm going to talk about AIDA in detail here with you guys right now. First, getting attention. And... To get attention from somebody, it's very important that your pitch, your overall presentation and your method hits a few points, right? There's a few big points that you want to hit. First of all, you have to say something big to get someone's attention. Nowadays, we live in a society where we are bombarded with you know, horrible messaging, <clears throat> not just horrible, but loud messaging continuously. You get bombarded in emails, you get bombarded in television, radio, all the ads online, almost all the news, all the time, every movie, every health report, everything is just doom, doom, or it's calamity, or it's, it's huge, right? So to get somebody's attention nowadays, you can't, you can't be low key. You have to be loud. You have to hit them over the head with a proverbial baseball bat to get their attention. So the way that I advise, and I know that a lot of you use this already when you're talking about somebody's website, Getting somebody's attention is, hey, your site has a problem. You've got an issue here. I noticed that you have a big problem. Well, what is it? The big problem is your site has, you know, is not catering to mobile customers, for example. Or your site doesn't load on smartphones. Your site doesn't load on tablets. Your site doesn't load properly. Your site has errors on it. Your site is pissing, pissing customers off. You're losing money here, right? You have that big message because... Most business owners, even you, you're, you can test this. I always like to take things and reverse them and play devil's advocate. If somebody came to me and said, my site's got huge issues, it's losing me money. I'm going to listen to the next sentence. I'm not hanging up. Now we move on from there. Being creative. Did we attend college together? Are we, is, you have to draw, you have to create the psychological binders with that person, right? Quickly. Very quickly, they're not going to listen to you for long. You get somebody on the phone, it's a business owner. You have to have a reason to listen to you, give them and spit them three or four sentences, right? We fight for all the attention we can get initially, right? So first big message stuns them. Then you hit them with something creative, right? You tell them, you know, you hit them with something like, have I been to your business before? I don't know. I might be a customer. I might be in your database. Something to get them to go, huh, they have a connection to you. They're going to listen to you for two seconds. Now, now I pivot, pivot immediately, and I go to something that's financial and personal. And these two things really are connected. You're talking about somebody's business. You're talking about them losing money. And you want to reach out to them, but you don't want to hit them with something, a message that's so big and unbelievable that, it, that they feel that they'd be credulous to listen to you, right? So if you're going to hit them, you hit them with something like, hey, you know, I see you're losing money on your site. I wanted to personally reach out to you because, you know, I saw that your site had issues here. Maybe you're not the person I thought you were. Maybe we didn't attend college together. Doesn't matter. The point is I'm reaching out to you personally and I'm telling you your site has an issue. Your site is losing money because it's not catering to mobile. It's an antiquated platform. It has no website personalization. It's missing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever those things are. You really, you tie it back to their loss of finance. You want to try to trigger greed and, you know, triggering greed and fear of loss, right? Or fear of loss and greed. You want to get this person to really start to listen to you because what you're talking about is something that's incredibly relevant. Now, I'm not saying you guys will use these exact methods, 
okay, that I'm throwing at you. These are the kinds of methods that over time I've noticed personally and I've seen that they are effective, right? When people get on the phone and they use techniques like this, they're effective. There are a lot of good techniques, okay? And back in the portal, we have a ton of advanced sales training. It's great stuff. I wanted to just pause and say that because a lot of people joined up, may not have heard at the beginning. What I said was I'm going over an anatomy of a sale here. I'm not going, you know, um, I'm, not, I'm not giving you an explicit method to apply. I'm giving you some general principles and we're going through some of the principles that people use who are successful in selling sites. And by the way, if any of you want to weigh in, of course, the chat line's open. You can go ahead and you can fire me questions. I'll answer them at the end. So moving on from getting their attention, you have to spark interest, right? Getting their interest. Well, what gets somebody interested? Opportunities, financial gains, things like that. Um, what competitors are doing, feeling like they're maybe behind the times. Maybe they should listen to you. Maybe what you're saying is relevant because if they don't, they're going to lose something. Preferences, if you can get them to feel like they're taking ownership. And the way I do things like that, getting people to take ownership of stuff, I've said this many times, but you know, you go to an auto dealership, they get you to sit in the car and drive it, right? So that you take ownership. It's a psychological principle. It's well documented. It goes all the way back to like, you know, the dawn of the last century. The way you get someone to take ownership of a website, a website isn't a thing. It's a creative process. And it's an, uh, that's how I look at sites. I look at them as creative pr processes that manifest themselves online. They're never really, they have no beginning. They have no end. There's something that's always evolving, right? Even if a website is done and we say it's done, it's sealed, it's delivered. You know, that's not the last website that business is going to have. It's not like a car. It's going to, you know, get torn down, rebuilt a thousand times. So to get them to take ownership, you want to get them to feel as though they're taking part in the creative process. You want to ask them questions about, well, if they could change something on their site, what would it be? Do they like the design of their site? Do they have other websites they like better? Do they have anything they would change? What would it be? You know, get them to start to give you their ideas. You want to get information out of them if you want to get them to take ownership. And this is especially true in the demo process when you're sitting down and, you know, you're gathering data to go and get a quote put together. It's incredibly important that during that time, you get them to really take ownership of this, right? So they really, they feel like, okay, you, you know, in reality, they haven't paid you anything and you're, you're going back to just get a price for them, but getting them to feel that they're taking ownership of this process and that um, they're going to have this made because they're psychologically, they commit to buying right then and there. That's when the sale's made psychologically. It may not be made in reality. It has to be, but psychologically. Now, the last thing is potentials, right? Potentials. And I always say this, a lot of people will put potentials in the front of the whole process, right? They'll talk about things like, um, you know, how the new site is going to make you money and it's going to do this and it's going to do that and all this stuff up front in the beginning. When in reality... Those things should come towards the end, I think, when you're sparking somebody's interest because you want to end on the highest possible note. For example, if I'm talking potentials, I'm going to talk about website personalization. I'm going to talk about social media. I'm going to talk about the ways in which we can build you a, a site that does all kinds of different things that helps promote your business and actually will bring you a gain, right? Because most people we sell, and you guys all know this, the sites that they've got aren't making them any money at all right? The sites they have right now are losers. They are. Let's face it. That's who our customers are. They're people who have sites that are screwed up a million different ways that are not doing anything beneficial for their business. Or if they are, it's very minimal. So when you talk about things that are potentials to, to turn that around, you know, to take this, this financial loser, this thing you paid three or four grand to have built that's just rotted on the web ever since, and throw it away, scrap it, and put something out there that earns you money, that's going to generate leads, that's going to generate interest, that's going to give you a way to communicate with your constituents, your customers. It's going to give you a way to market to your customers. It's going to give you all these new capabilities. You can rekindle life in the fire in these people of exactly what it is that they're doing. And that will spark tremendous interest if you can get somebody to start thinking that way. In conversation, it's not that hard. And I want to do in the future some webinars for you guys where I talk to actual people who are buying sites, right? Where I actually get on the phone with some of these people because it's telling you it's very easy once you get past, you know, the whole introductions phase and you start talking about what exactly it is you do and what technology you have offers, 
to lead it down to this preference and potentials area where they start taking ownership and dreaming about what the site can do for them. Once they start thinking that way, you're going to have a very high close rate. I think all of you who are here would agree with that. Now, pushing for the decision, right? You have to get them to decide they're going to let you pitch them. Because remember, at this stage, we're not pitching them, right? We're talking a little bit about what we do. We're getting that we're talking about some of the potentials of our technology, but we're not getting deeply into it. That's an important thing for me to mention here is we're not getting deeply into this. We start to get deeply in from this point on, right? Where we start pushing for the decision. And hold on just a moment, guys. Sorry about that, guys. I have to change up the presentation because that one, it is correct, but I have another one here that I have to put up on the screen. I apologize for that issue. Okay, hold on just a moment, guys. Okay, here we go. We'll go we'll be right back up. Just a moment. Okay, and sorry about that. Had multiple versions of the presentation. Anyway, pushing for the decision, you know, getting this person to, um, and can you guys see the screen okay? Can everyone see it? Can everybody hear me okay? I should have done a mic check. I did one earlier and Tom said he could hear me just fine, but I want to make double sure of that, that you guys can hear me okay and everything's all right. Is everything good? All right, great, great. Just wanted to make sure you guys can hear me all right and nothing's, uh, nothing's screwed up here. Hold on just one moment. Oh, <laughs> okay. You guys can hear me okay. I was just checking the microphone here and we'll go back to sharing the screen and I apologize. There we go. Okay. All right. Everybody should be able to see that now and hear me just fine. Okay. So pushing for the decision, this, say, this stage of sales, this stage of, um, you know, going ahead and, and doing what it is you, um, you need to do. At this point, you have to kind of withhold information because if you're getting the person, you know, we're going from, you know, we're walking over from sparking the interest to, to getting them to make this decision. If we give too much information here, right? If we, if we go from sparking interest to divulging information, if we cross over there, why would they have a demo with you, right? Why would they even book an appointment with you, you know? And a lot of people make the mistake because they get a person on the phone, right? They get their attention. They start talking to them because they've got interest. And then they go over the, over the line. They, they push way too far ahead and they go into a, the realm of way too much information. And when you do that, you're, you're done, right? The sale is done. You're not going to make the sale with this because this person has to have a reason. So what you do is you have to withhold information. And what you can do, there's a lot of techniques. You can say, hey, you know, I don't have the time. I really don't have the time to talk to you right now. And I really want to explain this stuff correctly. Let's book an appointment. If you can tell you have somebody's interest, that's when you pivot. That's when you go from explaining things to, I want to go on. I want to give you all this information but I'm sorry, I cannot give you all this information right now. There just isn't enough time and I want to explain everything about what I do and really go through and give you a detailed analysis and we'll, we'll spend a little time together and I'll take a look at your site with you. Crucial, you have to give them that reason for the, booking the appointment. And that's your offer, right? And I think a lot of people are missing that, right? When you get on the phone and you're talking to the prospect, you have to have that reason. You could tell them, I'm going to give you a free analysis. I'm going to, you know, take a look at your site with you. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to give you some consulting, whatever it is. Make it up. But you have to give them something, right? And usually it's just, you know, it's, it's just a consult, an analysis. And they understand. You're going to look at their site with them. Emphasize that there's no commitments. Big problem people make here is they, they kind of, some people tend to, tend to really, they get marbles in the mouth and they, they make it seem as though there's some big, that this is a big commitment, okay? At the point at which where you're getting them to decide whether they're going to have an appointment with you or not, 
you don't want them to feel at all pressured. There's no big commitment here, right? And you can emphasize, you know, that this is really in their best interest because you're going to help them to learn to do whatever to square away their site so that they can make more money online. Trigger greed if you have to, you know, go in there and talk financials, talk about how they're going to benefit from this, that um, they're going to learn from you what it is they need to do with their site and so on and so forth. But it's at this last stage here we call sparking action, right? At this stage where you're going to spark action, this stage is where, and this is the end of your, your you know, and we're going through right now the proverbial telemarketing call, right? You have to act like you're, you need to get away, right? At the point at which they've said, yeah, I want to make an appointment with you. Say, okay, well, let's schedule it right now. I'm busy. Let's get you booked. Make sure that you get them, get, you want to schedule with this person and you want to get off the phone, right? The initial phone call. You don't want to stay on. You don't want to take 15 minutes. This isn't romancing sales at this point, right? We're consultants. This is not a situation where we want to in any way cheapen ourselves in the eyes of that prospect. If we cheapen ourselves by spending a whole bunch of time, by, you know, begging for the lead, by, you know, there's lots of ways people screw up socially where they, they deflate themselves in the eyes of others. We want to tell them I'm pretty flexible between A and B time line on A and B day. Okay, let them know it's flexible. Let them know, you know, book up because my appointment is going to fill up. You can tell them my secretary's, you know, filling up my appointment right now. I think I can get you in at X time next week or X time this week or whatever. Once they've got it, once they've written down your appointment date, right? Once you know that they have that appointment booked, that's when you want to pivot again. And what you do when you pivot again is you hit them with, okay, I know we've made this appointment. Understand my time is valuable. And I really want to have this appointment with you. And you're not being nasty or anything. You're just telling them, look, my time is valuable. And I want to make sure that if I book time with you, that you will attend. And get them to, I always get people to promise they'll be there. And not only promise you'll be there, I want to know that you wrote it down. Right? I want to make sure. So please, could you give me your email address just so I can send a confirmation to you? Because I'm going to send you over and you, you know, maybe a Zoom meeting you're going to send them. Some of you use different screen sharing technologies and softwares, but the point is, let them know I'm going to send you stuff and I want to know that you're going to be there. And so, having done that, we move on. And now I'm going to talk about demonstrations, right? And how demonstrations are the engine of sales, all right? Demos are our first personal time with our prospect. I wrote your first meeting. You may conduct demos in different ways, right? Many of you are going to conduct your demos on the phone. Some of you are going to conduct them on the computer. Some of you are going to conduct them in real life. However you conduct your demonstrations, I'm talking about basically and fundamentally the same process. Now, those of you who know me know I favor local leads and an in-person sales process. That's what's been really successful for me through the years historically. It's what I put my stock in. I, however, having said that, there are literally probably tens of millions of sales of websites that occur over a computer. Okay, so it's not as if it can't be done at all. It's just my style the way I've been trained as a salesperson is very much an in-person uh, process, right? Of getting in front of somebody and talking to them. I always like to square up my opponent, so to speak. I think you can do almost the same thing with GoToWebinar and stuff like that. On the phone, you know, you can do it, you can do it too, but you're going to have to incorporate at some point presentations and materials to get your points across strong enough, I think, to trigger uh, sales in the largest group of people. And of course, all of us have different styles. Some of us are better at selling in person and some of us are better at selling over the phone or, or over, the, the, um, over the computer, although generally telesales is a dying breed. But uh, now, let's talk about goals for a moment. I'm going to move on from what I was just rambling about to you guys and talk about goals. The goal of the demonstration meeting, right? The goal of the, the meeting where you're going to show stuff off I think a lot of people are confused about this, right? It's not to close generally. I'm not saying you can't wrap up a website deal in 
one call. But in our model, you can't because you don't have a price yet. Unless you have, you know, a canned website that you're selling to everybody, you don't have a price. So you can't close. You can't close without the next interaction being a financial transaction. And the goal of this meeting is to gather information, to gather notes, to get to know your prospect, to gather all the info we're going to need to be able to give you a quote, right? And to end on a very positive note with another meeting booked and really booked and affirmatively booked the same way the first one was booked, right? That's the goal of this demo meeting, this first demonstration. And this is the big one, make no mistake. Because at the end of this one, you're probably going to know, I would say you're going to know 50, 60% whether this person will buy or not right here at the end. It's probably going to surprise you more often than not if they don't buy. So when you move ahead from here, let's just look at this little sales process here. You have a meeting set stage at the beginning, right? That's what I'm calling it anyway. Then you have your meeting held stage, then you have your closed meeting. And I'm just calling it that for the sake of just this webinar, right? These are just my terms I threw up here when I made this presentation. A meeting set, meeting held, closed meeting. Meeting held or demonstration meeting, you can call it a lot of different things, but the one in the middle is the one where you're going to demonstrate all of your, you know, your information. So meeting set is your first interaction. It's when you've cold called, let's say, or you called the lead for the first time. Meeting held is your second interaction where you actually have them, you know, watching you on a go to webinar or a zoom meeting or you physically go out to the location or you call them on the phone this is the one where you go over you know lots of lots of information and you're going to showcase and go through all the technology and all the abilities that you have and then the closed meeting is at the end so we're going to go over first here we're going over the demonstration you know let's talk about this set and setting right in person what do you have to bring you got to bring your laptop you got to bring your tablet and your smartphone, actually, it's missing something there. And your smartphone. If you're going out in person and you're not bringing these things, and they're not, and you're not prepared with these things, meaning batteries charged, desktop cleared off, browser cleared out, you've got a problem. Over the phone, you're just going to send a Zoom link, right? In per, you don't have to bring anything. You're at your office. You're going to send out a Zoom link. On the computer, you're going to send a Zoom link. And then, of course, optional, go in person. You know, that's my opinion. At the end, I threw it in. We, you know, it's optional because you can, a lot of the time, choose which kind of demo method you're going to have. And I know a lot of you that do, that do them all. I know people here that go in in person and work on their computer or, and their phone, a combination of, of all three. You know, where sometimes they'll have like a Zoom meeting sent to somebody via email and the person's like watching their desktop on their computer while they're talking to them on a dial in line on their phone. And, you know, they're still, you know, working that way and it works for them. So don't think that, you know, your set and setting needs to conform to what I think is the best or what anybody thinks is the best. It doesn't. It needs to work for you. Preparation is absolutely key. And I know that I've, I've literally had conversations with people on this call about preparation and, and how some of the people that work for them have come in unprepared and it's gotten you, you know, so, you know, just apoplectic with rage that you want it to like break stuff. Um, and I understand and I can relate to that because preparation is, it's really a huge part of what you want to do in the sales process, why preparation matters is you want to keep the emphasis on, you, you want to keep the focus on the central issue, not side issues. Batteries should be charged. Browser should be cleaned out. Desktop should be clean. No messes anywhere. You need a note-taking device, right? You know, usually a couple note-taking devices, right? You, uh, you want to have, you know, your, your pad and paper. You're also going to have your smartphone. We'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But, you know, you want to be ready to take notes because you're going to be doing a bunch of it. Mental preparation. Have you done your research? At this stage, and if I'm going into a demo and I haven't done any research on the person I'm going to demo, why am I wasting my time trying to sell them? Because I'm just goofing around, you know, and it's not worth anybody's time to just goof around. It's not even worth the, the prospect's time. It's not worth anyone's time. You know, what do I mean by that? Well, you need to take five minutes and research the company and the individual that you're going to have a demo with. You know, you have access to Google. 
You have access to Bing. You could go and do a search, learn about their business. Do they have a Google My Business listing? How is their website? Does it load on smartphones? Does it load on tablets? Does it load on desktops? How, how does it look? Is it old? Have you gone over to the website and done a view page source in your browser and seen if it's running WordPress or not? You know, have you informed yourself of the basic, basic crude fundamentals of this client? Because if you haven't, you know, you're, you're, it's like you're, you're taking your, you know, you're taking away ammunition from yourself. So always go, always, you know, go and do some basic research. Look up the competitors, you know, figure out a little bit about this person. Maybe you go over to Facebook and look them up. You know, it's really, it's up to you. Whatever you do, you inform yourself as much as possible so that you get on that call with this person and you have stuff to talk about. And then the showcase, right? And, I, and when it comes to the actual demo, I am not going through conduct of a demo here today because that would extend this conversation out to be way too long to fit into a webinar, but I'm going to go into a few parts of it. One of them is what I call the showcase stage, right? These are just some things that I think every demo includes, right? Or most demos include, right? Number one is having sites ready to show to the client. You're going to discuss replacing their website, presumably, right? So it would make a lot of sense if you have portfolio pieces from your site pulled up, some example sites that you found in the same industry or channel, right, that look nice, that you can showcase to them, you know, or get an idea of what they like. Um, have, of course, the client's website up. I've been on some demos where I was kind of like the mystery caller or the mystery shopper. And I would go and I would jump on a demo and see what process I was put through by you know, a web development company and it's amazing, but a lot of them didn't know my website, didn't know who I was, didn't know, you know, anything. And I'm not saying I, I pretended to be somebody famous or anything because I didn't, but I gave them this information, you know, and even though they had it, they didn't think to even have it ready. And they had to ask me mid demo to send them over my own URL, you know, and stuff like that. Have that stuff ready. These little things just make it so much more convenient to have your demo with somebody. Be ready to show problem areas to the client. Uh, not knowing what's wrong. It's easy to talk about what's right, but talk about what's wrong. A lot of people don't have that down. A lot of people need to have that down. You need to be able to show what's wrong. And it's incredibly easy to do so. It's not that it's some difficult thing. You know, it's that you look at their site. You see that it's antiquated. You see that you go and you right click and you do like a save image on an image or two and see if they're gigantic or small. You go and you go view page source in your web browser. It's like tools view page source in most browsers. You take a look. If you see WP all throughout there, you know that they're running WordPress. So they've got a website that's decaying. You know, you take a look and just analyze what you're looking at. And a lot of these areas are problem areas and you can bring them up in conversation. And if you do, you're going to be more successful in closing people. So it's important to your demo. Be ready to showcase our technology. Know our technology. Uh, it, you know, you should be able to know and spit out, you know, frontwards, backwards, and up and down and back and forth, whatever, what website personalization is and why it brings value. You should be able to talk about the various widgets. All this training is back there in the portal. You know, all that stuff. Be ready to showcase the technology. Have a plan too. Very important is the pre-planning, and I didn't go into this in this presentation, but there's pre-planning that plays a, a pretty significant role in everything, and that is knowing what you're going to sell to somebody, knowing what exactly they're going to get. You know, are you going to sell this person, um, you know, a one-page site, a five-page site, a 15-page site, an e-commerce site? Is this, you know, understanding that beforehand roughly, because of course, their input is going to ultimately dictate what gets sold, but you should be able to tell anybody who asks, roughly speaking, what's going to get sold. Now, some key demo, demo points here. And these are just some general truisms that can empower you in the demo process. Number one, most prospect sites are awful. They are truly awful. If a site doesn't load on a phone, it's awful nowadays, guys. It's, it means that that site was made by somebody operating at like 2007 or prior, you know, technological sophistication. Everything built from then forward should be mobile friendly. It's not, 
you know, that's, that's not acceptable. Most sites are WordPress, meaning they're not user editable, uh, meaning they have all sorts of technological issues and errors, meaning that updates on them can break the site and often do, meaning that they have security vulnerabilities and they often are not patched. So there's all kinds of issues with that. But there are 14% of all sites, but a huge percentage of business sites, right? Because there's a giant chunk of websites out there that are personal websites. WordPress, in reality, is a huge, huge chunk of business sites. You will encounter it a lot. Know, know its weaknesses. Know its weak points. Know how, in conversation, to pick it apart. The more you know how to pick it apart, the more you encounter it, the higher your chances are that you're going to win the deal when you're up against WordPress. None of those sites have website personalization. None of them. And just about, I mean, it's, it's got to be infinitesimally small number of sites out there that you're going to actually encounter. And I'd be curious, has a single person on this call ever encountered in the field a website that a client had that had website personalization of any kind? Not just of, not, a, not of a sophisticated nature, but of any kind. I'd be curious. Raise, a, raise your hands, guys, if, if you've encountered this. I don't see a single person raising their hand or, or saying, yes, they have. Many have security issues in the past. Many, many, many people, if you talk to them, business owners, they're going to tell you, hey, my site, yeah, a year ago it was down for three days because someone hacked it or I had a DOS attack. I have dead pages on my site that can't be fixed by the company that built it. They just leave them there dead. They died because of an update and patch of WordPress. Okay, these are key points, right, that you can bring up and you can exploit in conversation that are going to they're going to show you and tell you and guide you to a sale, right? Most prospects hate their websites, hate them, actually hate them. And, and this is, I really have really can't stress, guys, how much, how true that is. You know, when you're out there and you're dealing with, you know, you have a pizza shop owner or whatever, and I'm always using pizza shop owner. I've got to stop that. Got to throw a new industry in there. How about plumber? When you're out there and you talk to a plumber, about their, you know, website. And, you know, they're talking about how they're trying to get appointments set on it and the booking system doesn't work and the forms don't, don't go across to their email and they can't change anything. You're going to realize they hate their site. Really helpful in the demo process. Now, let's review. I'm going to go over just a, a few key points of our technology. One I already have sort of beat to death, and that's website personalization. As you guys know, Website personalization is very, very important. It's, you know, a feature uh, that we have as technology, as a technology that is not only really big and important now, but it's going to just grow and grow and get better and better as time goes on because the level and degree of personalization that we offer is doing nothing but getting better. The next is SaaS technology. A lot of people, you know, it's kind of, it's one of those 60-40 things, right? But it's really 80-20. You know, people will say, I don't like SaaS because I have to pay a monthly fee for it, right? And they'll say, it's better that I pay one time and I own whatever I buy. And you could say, yeah, I understand, you know, because, hey, it's, you know, I, I own my car, right? I don't lease it. But let me tell you the advantages of SaaS. When you go into the advantages, and then you, I know a whole bunch of people already know the advantages, but the people who are skeptical, when you start bringing up the advantages, just about all of them are going to be turned around because you bring up the advantages of SaaS. Number one, your website's ageless, right? Your website does not get old, right? The site you have now is obsolete. Yeah, you own it. You own, you know, you own that thing the way that, uh, you know, I own a hamburger that I ate last week. You know, it's not something that I want to own anymore. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's kind of the situation, you have a website online that doesn't load on smartphones. It's not doing a good job. Um, you know, you, your customers, they're going to understand this, this point that our sites, number one, are going to update themselves. You're never going to have plugins fail like with WordPress. You're never going to have security threats like with WordPress. You're always going to have a site that has bulletproof technology built right into it. It's going to have advanced analytics. It's served to you like any other service that you have served to you, right? It's like you don't own electricity in your house. You pay a service. You pay for it every month. 
You don't own water either. You know, you pay for it every month. A lot of people own their wells, but you get my point. Um, it's another service that you pay for to run your business. And it's 100% tax write-off, right? It's not something that they're losing money on. So it should be there as a service. That should be somebody else's problem to handle and deal with. By buying and owning the site, they're saying they're, they're putting themselves in a position of a car owner that has to go to a mechanic every time it breaks down. Unfortunately, you know, websites are not like cars. Cars can go many years with just basic maintenance. Websites, however, become obsolete quickly when they break down. It's very expensive to have them fixed. Now you can talk about our vast widgets. You can talk about social media integration. You can talk about a lot of things. I just put some bullets up here, just six bullets, because, you know, the truth is this could be pages and pages reviewing our technology. And, I, you know, we're already at 545. So with 15 minutes to go, I'm going to move on here. Now, something very important to the sale of sites, the easy process, right? The process is very important to get across to somebody. You know, because like I've said in countless other videos I've done, you know, the development process scares a lot of people away, keeps a lot of people from making the uh, decision to upgrade and get a new site, right? Simple development process. Let them know this is not like the process you went through to develop your old site. Let them know we can build your new site based on the content from the old site. So if you have an eight, and this is very commonly done, if you have an eight page website and it's got, you know, seven pages of content, one page is a contact page, is just a form. If you have that right now and it's falling apart, it's ugly, it doesn't load on mobile, it's screwed up in every which way, what we can do is we can use that template to rebuild, right? In other words, we can use the content from those seven pages and just strip the content out and put them over into your new site so that your new site will get its content from the old site. So you don't have to go back through a miserable process of writing and, and you know, content creation because most people who are business owners are not content creators. They're not writers. They're not photographers. They're not graphics designers. They're business owners that own businesses doing stuff like plumbing, right? Or other things, electricians or you know, they're doing something completely else. So they fear that process. When you let them know how simple it is, that it's a fast process of grabbing the content from the old site, rebuilding the site, using it, they're going to be much more receptive to the idea of buying this. Let them know about cost effectiveness, that the website should be making them money. This is a concept that's really a, a carryover from the 90s, but it's really kind of astounding when we do surveys and stuff and you see people say, oh no, my site doesn't make me any money. I don't get leads from it. I don't get calls or anything like that. The smartphones are, you know, a kid's toy. You know, when you, when you hear people and they actually think this way, you go, wow, you know, there's people out there who really need to wake up and realize that this is a cost effective money generator. You know, I don't care if you're running a hair salon, if you're running a, a hotel, if you're running a restaurant, whatever you're running, the website should be how people are finding you, contacting you on the phone or interacting with you via emails or from, from, from sent from web forms. The professionalism, you know, you can really, really lean on the fact that you have portfolios that you can showcase of sites that have been built. You know, you can showcase uh, what's been done before and you can bring this up uh, to the prospect. And you can always bring up your track record and your reputations. Something that a lot of people, you know, seem to skip past, but it's important. Now, site showcase. Show competitor sites in the demo process. This is not necessarily in order, but showing competitor sites in the demo process can be really beneficial as well. I like to show competitor sites that are not in the same area. If I'm going to have a conversation, I don't want to talk up the competitor down the street that this business owner, you know, hates, all right, and competes with day to day to survive. I'm going to bring up a competitor from like, you know, the other side of the country or whatever. Um, and I'm going to show it to them, you know, and I'm talking like a best case scenario, like when I'm showing their sites all screwed up, this other site's great. Well, the site that's great, I'm going to show a site from a business they have no idea about that's on the other side of the country. And then you, sometimes you have to emphasize the inevitability of change, right? This is a little principle. It's something that's brought up quite a bit. And I've heard it out of the mouths of several people here that the customers took the plunge when you threw the contract down and said, hey, this is, this is inevitability. Emphasize local customers. If it's a local business and regional, if it's a regional business, always emphasize the type of customer that that business is going for. 
of course, showcase your portfolio sites. And again, emphasize the ease of development assuage fears. Now here on note-taking, I'm going to make a couple points on note-taking here just really quickly. And I'm going to run through this. And then the next thing, we're going to go into the needs analysis and uh, we'll take Q&A. But bring a pen, paper, and a smartphone. Always do this, guys. Always bring materials with you to take proper notes. A mistake people make a lot is not having notes. And you ask them basic questions about the client, they don't have the information because they never thought to ask. Always get, get everything that's going on in this conversation down on paper. Remember, we're still talking about you having a demonstration meeting, right? Where you're gonna show off the technology we've got, where you're gonna talk about having a site built for them, and where you're going to gather information to get a quote put, put together for them, or a proposal put together for them, right? So you're gonna get the quote from us, add on your margin, and then you're gonna build a, pro, a proposal out and deliver it to them to close them in the next meeting. So you wanna take a huge amount of notes because the more information you get down on paper, the more information you're going to be able to use in that next meeting to be able to close that person out. Also, remember, take notes after the meeting and always ask if you can record your meeting. I know, I know some clients are going to say, or some you know, prospects are gonna say, no way, I don't feel comfortable with that. That's fine. You know, you're not recording everybody, but a huge percentage of people are going to say, yeah, that's fine. I don't care. You can just slap your smartphone down, hit record, and have a conversation and not even worry about note-taking because you can do that after the meeting's over. You can go back and listen to the recording and take notes from that. But of course, if you do record this way, make sure you do it right. You know, have your smartphone between the two of you. Have it in a place that's going to be able to listen. It's not like the movies where you can turn it on and leave your smartphone in your purse and you know, you'll get a good recording. You won't. Now, think of the goal, the goal of notes. The goal of notes is to get a hard quote from us. The notes are really for us, right? To tell us, this is what we're building. We're building, a, you know, we're, we're, we get an order from you and it says in there, we're going to get, you know, a 12 page site. You want, you want a quote for a 12 page site, no e-commerce, no products, standard site. We're going to look at this and we're going to base our quote upon the number of pages, right? That's how we do it. That's how we operate. So make sure you get that information on paper and you get it on there correctly. 90% of site structures mirror old sites, right? So 90% of sites that come our way, they mirror old sites. Person comes here and says, I want a 12-page site because I have a 12-page site and I want 12 pages of content the content from the old site put into the new site. And it's a very simplistic, simple process. Far afield ideas can ruin site development. This is very important as well. And I've seen this happen too. And that's where conversations with clients are not managed and the client cooks up some crazy scheme, you know, to put together, you know, a website with all kinds of custom code and custom development. And it's totally unnecessary. And it costs, it's going to cost them a lot, lot of money. And of course, it's going to cost you a lot of money because it's going to cost us a lot of time and resources to furnish. So far afield ideas, generally speaking, cost money. Think of it that way. It's the easiest way to conceptualize it. They cost money. They slow down development. They're possible, but they're, cost, they're not cost effective necessarily. Page print counts can always easily be mapped right then and there. Really important point. A lot of people struggle with, you know, how many pages is the site going to have? Well, you have to tell us. We don't know. We're building the site. We're like your industrial machine shop. You know, you're walking in the door and telling us what we're going to make. So you can sit down with the client. You can figure out by looking at the old site how many pages, generally speaking, the new site's going to have. Now, they may want to add a few pages to it or they might want to remove a couple, or they might want to change a couple, but you can generally establish that baseline from the old website. It's very simple to do that. Always err on the side of caution. And I know I say this in other videos, but I'm mentioning it here as well. If you have, have to guess between 10 and 12 pages on a site, just put down 12. Let us know, hey, it's 12 pages, so that we never get into a situation where we've priced it out and stretch the pricing and we're gonna give a 10 page site and then suddenly it's a 12 page site and the price has to rise. 
because, you know, we understand from history, you know, from past experiences, that's how clients cancel. That's no good. It's not right to do. So always err on the side of caution and put down a higher page count as opposed to a lower. Anyhow, guys, I'm going to wrap up today's webinar. I'll talk to you guys soon. Have a great one. Bye, everybody.